A thousand years ago, creepy things people did were just considered another day at the castle. Whether it was cleaning your clothes in pee or buying groceries with eels, there was no end to the weirdness. Here are some creepy things that were considered normal a thousand years ago. We like to imagine that human sacrifice was something that mostly happened in the unimaginably distant past, before people started to get an inkling that maybe the gods just aren't that into blood and severed heads. But just a thousand years ago, people and cultures all over the world were still practicing human sacrifice. Some South American people like the Toltecs were still doing it, but also, surprise, the Vikings. The Vikings' blot sacrifices were a pretty regular thing right up until Christianity started to get a foothold around 1000 AD. Vikings would sacrifice people in exchange for stuff. You would have a blot sacrifice if you needed good weather for your crops, to do well in a raid, or maybe if your History Channel series was suffering from declining ratings. India had its own human sacrifice practice, which was popular from about 550 through the 18th century. Called Sati, it was the expectation that if a widowed woman did not have any surviving children, she should throw herself onto her husband's funeral pyre and burn to death. You know, so as to not be a burden to anyone. In the early years of this horrific practice, sati was something a woman did willingly, but at its peak, it was a requirement. Sati was eventually outlawed, though occasionally there are reports of it happening even today. A thousand years ago, if you needed surgery, you didn't go to a physician, you went to a barber, because, you know, scissors. Evidently, people thought that a person who was skilled at cutting hair would also be skilled at cutting human flesh. Physicians were exclusively reserved for the upper class, and a proper physician was way too educated to touch blood or, God forbid, the broken limbs of a dirty peasant. The barber, on the other hand, would handle the care of regular people. It was his job to set broken bones, lance infected wounds, treat injuries, and, if he was skilled enough, saw people's limbs off, and perhaps give them a nice pompadour while he was at it. The really freaky thing about all of this was that physicians were properly educated and accredited at a university and did practically nothing except advise. Meanwhile, the folks who did hands-on stuff that could kill you if it went wrong basically learned it all on the job. Modern medicine may have its problems, but yikes. Today, we believe very strongly that pee belongs in a toilet. When a thousand years ago, people actually thought pee was good for other stuff, too. This belief dates back at least as far as the Roman times, when people would wash their clothes in pee. So good news, if your cat pees in your clean laundry by ancient Roman standards, that makes it cleaner. Now, really, pee was considered so vital to proper care of clothing that cities would set up barrels on the street for people to pee into, and then they would collect the pee and take it to the public laundry to be put to good use. This is obviously disgusting, but it's not as crazy as you might think. Urine contains ammonia, and ammonia is still commonly used as a cleaning agent. In fact, even after people invented soap, they still liked to use pee for the laundry because the ammonia was better at loosening up tough stains. It was also great at helping dye stick to cloth, so it became indispensable to the textile industry. As late as the 16th century, people were still collecting pee specifically as a mordant, or a treatment that cloth makers could apply to fabric to ensure bright, long-lasting color. Sadly, no one seems to know how they eventually got that smell out, because cat pee is forever. Ask most people if corpses can solve their own murder, and the answer will be, of course not. Ask a modern forensic scientist, and the answer will probably be, kind of, since clues found on a corpse quite frequently lead to a suspect. But a thousand years ago, people did actually think that corpses could speak, in a sense. The practice was known as cruentation. It's what people did because they didn't know about DNA, and frankly, they were pretty hopeless at things like gathering evidence, interviewing witnesses, or even caring whether or not they found the actual perpetrator. It was more important to execute some person than it was to make sure you were executing the right person. In those days, people believed that dead people weren't, like, completely, utterly dead. Which means that Miracle Max from Princess Bride was historically accurate. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Early crime investigators thought that if you put a corpse into the presence of its killer, the body would start to bleed. Now, this makes for really dramatic forensics, but the problem was that corpses don't really bleed much after death, so this technique probably didn't lead to a guilty verdict very often. But never mind, there was always a lake they could throw the accused into instead, since buoyant people are clearly more guilty than the ones who sink. Bartering isn't really a thing anymore, at least not in America. A thousand years ago, though, currency wasn't something everyone had, so if you needed food or goods, you had to find other things you could use for money. You know, like eels. Yes, people in England actually used eels for currency. In fact, by the Middle Ages, there were distinct rules about how to count eels. If you had 25 eels, that was a stick. And if you had 10 sticks, that was a bind. 
The importance of eels to the economy of England dates all the way back to the 8th century, and eels even had a prominent place in 11th century record books. They actually seem to suggest that people paid their rent with eels more often than they did with coins. So why eels? Well, monasteries were big landholders in those days, and collecting rent in eels meant that the monks would never go hungry. Also, feasts thrown by the king often featured eels, so the nobility needed large quantities of them quite often. One popular movie trope has folks circa 1,000 or so years ago tossing buckets of poop into the street, usually from at least the second floor. You know, so we can all laugh at the poor dude who happened to be walking by at the exact right moment. I believe this really is just a trope. Fortunately, there is not much evidence that people actually did this. But that doesn't mean that people who lived a thousand years ago knew much about the potential of feces to transmit awful diseases, especially if it gets into a major water source like the Thames, for example. City dwellers who lived in England a thousand years ago did have to get rid of their poop, and like many modern humans, they ascribed to the dubious policy out of sight and out of mind. It means they were totally cool with just dumping all of their waste into a nearby river, where it would be washed downstream and become someone else's problem, at least in theory. Of course, since everyone was doing it, it eventually became everyone's problem, but it still took a rather disgustingly long time for people to realize that maybe the Thames wasn't the best place to dump raw sewage. Ancient people knew where babies come from, of course, but figuring out contraception was a bit trickier. Unfortunately, the stuff that people tried to do to prevent pregnancy a thousand years ago was mostly borderline gross, or sometimes flat-out disgusting. Here's one that's not super awful, but still highly ill-advised using a lemon as a cervical cap, which is a practice that dates all the way back to the second century and was still in use during the days of the infamous swinger Casanova. There were also condoms, which sound pretty refreshingly normal compared to lemons, but they were made out of animal guts because rubber and latex weren't actually things a thousand years ago. And as a bonus though, animal gut condoms were reusable. If you were put off by any of those things, don't worry, you could always drink a lead-infused potion, which probably was actually pretty good at making you infertile. We like to imagine that the people of the distant past were not super romantically adventurous. They were polite and chivalrous, and everything they did in the bedroom was within the bounds of matrimony and 100% approved by the church. But actually, kinkiness is as old as time, and for as long as there have been eels to pay the tab, there have been ladies of the evening willing to indulge customers' weird fantasies. And one of those weird fantasies was common enough that it persisted through the centuries. Sex workers who hung around in cemeteries usually did pretty brisk business. Why? Well, in the Middle Ages, cemeteries were kind of like Party Central. The townspeople would set up graveyard markets, and if you wanted to drink and gamble, you could settle down on your loved one's grave for a beer and a game of dice, and no one would think that was all that weird. But even before that, from the Roman times onward, the ladies of the evening, so to speak, found that they could do dual business in cemeteries. Mourners were hired by day and other stuff at night. Their customers were grave diggers, widowers, and people who had some pretty weird graveyard fetishes. And this wasn't just a passing fad, either. This quirk continued to be a thing for centuries, reaching its peak in 14th century England when the Black Death was killing a lot of people and totally messing with everyone's boundaries. Today, we could really not imagine undergoing a surgical procedure without the use of anesthesia. Not just because it would be awful for the person going under the knife, but also because it would be impossible for the surgeon, who would have to somehow perform precise maneuvers around vulnerable blood vessels and organs while the patient was writhing like a beheaded snake. But it took a long time to develop anesthesia. People recognized the need for surgical procedures thousands of years ago before anyone could even guess that it might be possible to make surgery pain-free. So if you were unfortunate enough to need an operation, you had a couple of choices. Die or have surgery while totally awake and totally lucid. The Greeks, Chinese, and other ancient people did have some form of rudimentary anesthesia. But in Europe, there were few reports of real attempts at pain relief until the early 13th century. That's when surgeons started to experiment with stuff like opium and mandrake. Up until then, if you needed a procedure or, God forbid, you had to have your arm sawn off, you basically got a bottle of whiskey and a piece of wood to bite down on and you pray that you would pass out from the pain before it got super awful. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about world history are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.